He's a staff software engineer at Coinbase. Nikhil Sharma, he's an engineer at Postman. Saurav Verma, he's an engineer at Tata 1MG. Matthew, senior software engineer at Medallia. and Mohammed Rafi, engineer at Pushaul. <laughs> He's the famous one here, I believe. <laughs> okay, please have sense. Okay, the good thing here is I can shamelessly see at my screen uh, for all the questions that I have to ask. <laughs> uh, okay, so uh, the topic of this panel discussion is what are the expectations from web framework? Like it itself is a very straightforward question, but at the pressure of you know breaking it into multiple ones. Uh, so the first question I have for you all is: so why did you choose to go with a par particular framework in whatever uh, last project you did? Like I don't want to know about the pros and cons of you know one framework up, up or I mean versus the other. Just one feature that one framework had that sold it for you that I should go ahead with this one. So we can start with Pratik. So it's working? Okay. Yeah. Cool. So I guess uh, as, as soon as uh, I started working on large scale applications, one of the biggest thing was maintainability and like bringing on folks on the team and getting them to write code which would not regress performance, right? So guardrails would be the one keyword. If my, if my framework can tell me and the rest of the team that um, you're basically doing something which would go and regress your performance, not just, the, not just like have those primitives which would give you good performance but would also warn you against using anti-practices, that would be one of the major things that I would easily get sold on. Okay, so which framework did that which you actually, you know, accepted? One of the good ones that I currently use is definitely Next, right? Uh, it, it has a bunch of primitives, components, Im image components and stuff, but basically can also yell at you when you are just going towards something which is not optimized for scaling uh, or performance at scale. Okay. Nikhil, do you have anything to add to it? Yeah, like uh, I don't like have any like any strong history around like using frameworks. Uh, so back in like my college days, uh, I started you like started this journey while uh, using Angular. So it's like mostly like the like to answer your question, the most uh, you know important term or like a feature that I thought of. Uh, was like you know mind blowing for me at that time was uh, the concept of shadow DOM and like how everything works like a, out of the box when you have like data mining and stuff. So it was mostly like that. Uh, but yeah, there's also React that like if uh, there's React obviously, but there is a very thin line around like if it's a framework or if it's a library with the, st the amazing stuff that these libraries and the frameworks are doing. But yeah, that was yeah. Mostly. I mean, just to be specific, we are not talking about just React frameworks, we are talking about any framework. So, yeah. yeah. Sort of. Uh, I also started off with Angular, but uh, recently I've been doing React for the last Close five Angular. years. Uh, what I found with Next.js, which was my choice of framework just recently, is that it was very easy to set up and we wanted to use it in a place where we did not really care about performance. It was an internal tool. It's so easy to get next running, routing set up, and if you just want to do server side rendering and everything right off the go, right? Uh, so I think that uh, there is no really steep learning curve when you want to boot something up. Uh, so like documentation websites are very easy on next. And I don't want to uh, use the framework that we use in production because that would require people uh, to spend a lot of time to actually get that documentation website going. Okay. Yeah. 
Um, yeah, I've also had an Angular background back in, I don't know, like six years ago, like uh, when I was doing like Ionic with Angular 1.3 and etc. <laughs> yeah, you feel me? Um, one, one of the things I would say is performance, but I don't want to go repetitive here. Uh, another thing I think a lot is developer experience and how the framework fits in with the ecosystem. So, for example, um, even though like my last couple of years have been focused a lot on React and everything in the ecosystem, so Next, Gatsby, uh, React, Inferno, whatever. Uh, but I did experiment a bit, for example, when Vue first came out and uh, when Svelte first came out because they had like really good selling points. But I admit that, for example, back then I was so into JSX and everything that React brought together in the ecosystem that even though, okay, they got this one and this one better benchmark, uh, I still can see, okay, people are improving this performance side of React uh, with Preact or Inferno, so that the whole developer experience is, is a still smoother. Um, it's been a couple of years since I played with them, so I don't know, I've heard that at this point, for example, Svout has way better support for TypeScript and etc. So, but anyway, uh, I would say that developer experience is one key thing to me, and uh, because I see that actually this repeats throughout the community, not only with front end. So, if even if we look at programming languages, for example, Elixir, uh, that's like background uh, backend language for that runs in the Beam virtual machine and etc. Uh, that was basically taking something that was there for decades a length and then adding like a better environment for engineers and more friendly syntax and so I think this this is one thing and another thing is saying like uh, how they've been aligned with the web platform so this has been always uh, some kind of an issue with react uh, they've always had their own syntax event system and etc but and uh, it's still like that, but that's something that they've been addressing throughout the years. And uh, the other factors I mentioned in my talk as well, like scheduling and et cetera. So seeing how they're aligned with the whole platform, uh, like for Remix, uh, like how they're using the power of forms and et cetera, things that the web gives you, I, I think that's another factor I would count other than performance. Okay. Uh, I actually have a history of uh, starting side projects that I never complete. So my GitHub repo is probably f like haunted by side projects, right? So whenever I actually choose a web framework, I tend to choose something that is like familiar to me. As in, like, it doesn't need to be the same framework that I used before. It's like in a familiar stance. So, since I'm used to React, like React flavored things. And also, uh, when you actually build a project, right? You like actually want to focus on the project, not on the build tools, at least when you are building it initially. So I tend to pick uh, frameworks or anything that would actually help me you know, get to that MVP initially, quickly, whatever it is. And most of the times that tend to stick as like, you know, the thing that is there forever. Like, you, you've never refactor, like, serious. Yeah, I mean, if, if I can summarize what you all have said, you have almost covered everything from DX to, you know, uh, familiarity and uh, dev uh, I mean, debugging and everything. <laughs> so I think, you know, what we can see here is that if you combine all of that, you are talking about almost all the features that a web frame framework should give. Uh, and one more thing that uh, I'm surprised to hear is actually, not surprised actually, but we talk a lot about, you know, uh, Angular, Angular 1, but I think for most of us, what actually attracted us, like, for most of us, our first framework was Angular. Uh, it might be because of two-way data binding or whatever that attracted us look like. It might be a crime, it might be evil, but it's very useful that actually attracts you towards it. So uh, that's a good point. Uh, so where do you struggle with the framework of your choice? Like we have talked about why you chose something, but every framework comes with, you know, okay. Later you realize that this framework is missing something, right? Whatever you choose, it doesn't matter. So, uh, yeah, Pratik. Right. Um, one of the common pain points is 
a lot of JavaScript frameworks. I won't talk about web frameworks. Uh, at least the JavaScript frameworks are super emphasized on authoring uh, the code, right? And how do we deliver this code? I guess it's high time we start thinking about like once this has this code has gone into production, what what is how are users reacting to this? Uh, how how are my uh, metrics dipping? How are my met uh, how are my metrics looking? They may or may not be like business related metrics, right? They can be as simple as web vitals. So the monitoring, post authoring, right? Or uh, debugging what has gone uh, what has gone wrong, what has gone sideways, post authoring experience is something that I think about a lot. Uh, that would have been like a real bliss if JavaScript frameworks start putting them in. Okay. Right. That was my follow up question, but you have okay. already covered it. <laughs> Anyways, we'll continue continue with the same question. Like, what do you think? Uh, yes, uh, I think one of the most toughest things uh, today's frameworks do is that opting out isn't easy. Right? Once you go into a framework, you're sort of vendor logged in to whatever the framework wants to do, and it would be really amazing to see frameworks that could let us choose different flavors. Because at the end of the day, I feel like web frameworks are primarily just a bunch of opinions brought together. Right? And your opinions might vary, or your requirements might vary from what their opinions are. Uh, but every single framework out there I've seen makes it so tough for you to opt out of something. Uh, when you opt out of one thing, they say that we're not going to do any of the other optimizations that we are claiming to do. So that is something that I really run okay. into quite often. Matthias, do you have any opinions about this? Um, I think it's one of the first things that came to my mind is uh, one discussion I was having with Nikhil this morning uh, that kind of has to do with balancing flexibility and consistency when it comes to the framework. So I've seen teams picking up Next.js over SSR, other SSR alternatives. Uh, because Next.js enforced some guidelines and the, for example, some of these people were people who were doing Angular when you had like really str st more tight uh, guidelines on that. So I think that it's not, probably not the pain point, but one of them is like uh, when designing the framework, whether you want to be more permissive or more enforce more stuff at framework level. So, yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. Finish, like, I'll just take another minute, Rafi. So, uh, we were like having this very interesting discussion, uh, just as he mentioned. And just to extend upon this, uh, we were talking, as he said, we were talking about the fact that every web framework that we have, like, especially, like, let's talk about JavaScript frameworks, like, that I've used. Uh, these, those are all awesome and uh, the thing is they bring in some perspective of theirs because you know there's no defined definition of a best practice right like you can't just have a silver bullet saying like if you want to do code splitting like here's the only way if you want to do routing this this is the only way that's the best right so with this like although it's very interesting to see like different corners like people looking at it at different angles and it helps choose like oh that it could be used like this oh there's another way of using it so this is good uh, but but at the same time, as Saurav mentioned, right? Uh, I would also want uh, web frameworks. Like it's just my personal suggestion. Although they're doing great stuff, but uh, there can be sort of a middle ground where uh, a web framework brings in its own perspective of doing things, but it also gives you an opt-in feature of like, like let's say I use like some uh, like a framework. Let's say Next.js or Remix, any framework, and maybe in the future I realize that hey, like my requirements have changed a bit, which I had not, you know, anticipated for. Now, for that requirement, I might not have to change the web framework entirely, right? So that framework should give me sort of a, a way to, you know, scale it on top of things, like just provide me a way to, you know, opt in some other stuff. So this is like one, one thing that like I am really curious about when using web frameworks and something like along with it, uh, maybe I think Rafi might mention about it, but uh, a, like, a developer community and uh, people who are like very interested about that framework is something I look for because if there are people already building like cooler stuff on top of it, uh, it's really easier to choose that way because it might not have a support of something now, but 
if people are using it, you might not know. There might be tons of libraries or plugins that are going to come in with it. So that's the thing. So, yeah. Okay. Rafi? So uh, one particular thing that I actually like have faced issues with a lot of web framework, starting with Backbone, then to Angular, and then to React, and then to Next, and so on, is all the abstractions are leaky, right? They are not perfect uh, abstractions, right? So let's say if you take Angular 1, like the oldest one. So it came in with, uh, what do you call, like double bind, like binding, data binding, right? That is not proper. If you do something outside that in like plain JavaScript, right? It actually breaks. It, it doesn't like work well. Of course, React also has its own issues on the same lines. So like abstractions, whatever we build in the in whatever framework won't be perfect. Like so it would be nice if framework, uh, how do you put it, provide a way to like somehow deal with this leakiness because it's never going to be fixed. It's probably going to be reduced, but it's never going to be fixed. Like figure out a, like a way to deal with this like le leaky abstraction issues like whenever it happens and like sorry. Okay, uh, fine. Uh, my next question is similar, so I I'm not going to you know summarize this, but your answer might differ. Like you talked about different problems that you face with the current web framework that you are using, but some of the problems are. Uh, I think those problems are not easy to fix. Like you know the problem was uh, of. Uh, making it uh, like opt, opt out easy making opt out easy is not something that uh, that is a trivial problem to solve but there must be few things that you you must think that okay it, it would have been great if my framework actually did this uh, not as big as you know opting out but something maybe you know something that your use case is but your framework is not serving it uh, so are there things like that like are there such kind of improvements that you want in the framework of your choice? Anyone? Yes, please. Yeah, so I can go in. <laughs> so uh, one thing that I am uh, like really passionate about is adding like some security practices when I'm like using a framework, right? So like what I have seen, uh, although like that my knowledge might be like slightly limited, but uh, I have seen like very like, uh, you know, security practices like adding uh, security headers to your APIs whenever like you're making network calls. But like what I'm more curious about is if I'm using a framework, I don't want to like care about if my hacker, like any hacker in the world can, you know, uh, trespass my app in some way. Like I don't want to think about those sort of extractions uh, altogether. So like this is one thing that I really look forward to like uh, in like any future improvements that the web frameworks might bring in. So this is one point that I had, yeah. Yes, that's a great point. Uh, yeah, you also want to say something. Yeah, uh, if frameworks made uh, transitions and animations easier, <laughs> man, that would be so good, right? I second that, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's so tough to do uh, things across routes, and uh, we have to write all sorts of data sharing pipelines and preload things, pre-render things, just so that we could s seamlessly migrate to a different route. Uh, that is extremely tough today, and I don't see frameworks working towards doing anything good there. Uh, one concern that I have always had is that abstractions are pretty high in frameworks. For example, when uh, Mohammed talked about uh, Angular, right, uh, and two-way data binding in Angular, I was fairly young then. I had just started writing, uh, building websites with Angular, and to me, uh, that's how I. Uh, thought browsers were working, right? So I never looked at orchestrating my own way of binding data and view. To me it was, okay, this is how it works, it's just magic. And I think a lot of frameworks for a lot of people is magic. And we, need, we should probably have toggles or areas where we could lower those abstractions or have maybe deep, detailed information about how things are working underneath. So that as people start growing from software developer one to two, three, uh, and they're framework intensive, like dependent on the framework, they slowly get to learn as well. Okay. Okay. That's a problem. Uh, do you want to take this? Uh, another thing I would love to see uh, is, for example, and that's one of the amazing things that Svelte does, uh, and I w I'm looking forward to the feature of React, is like, uh, getting more compile time optimizations but for performance. I think that one of the 
things that React misses the most nowadays, and not only React are, are more optimizations. Of course, we we can, we have optimizations when it comes to tree shaking and that kind of stuff. But I mean more in terms of Svelte. But of course, it's it's not it's tricky because of the whole nature of virtual DOM when you compare that to reactivity and etc. But I'd love to see that. And uh, because he spoke about abstraction leaks, um, one thing uh, I'm not saying it's going to happen, but uh, it would be interesting to see. We going back when we didn't have to uh, to think a lot about memorizing every single thing we do, or and uh, like when we had less abstraction leaks in, in in React, for example. So yeah, having like the default state being fast again would be something to be to be interesting to see, and I think compilers might be one of the ways. Before going ahead, we have used this term abstractions a lot, right? Can you explain what they mean? There are a lot of people who might not have heard about it. So we want to explain what abstractions actually mean. Um, not abstractions themselves, but when we meant abstraction leaks is, for example, <laughs> sorry, I need to make the reference. So in the, the session, my session, I, I showed the, the talk of 2013 when React was starting to be the thing and etc. And uh, the default state was fast and etc. But then, so you had this abstraction that you just wrote your components and they were faster. Because back then what you had was jQuery and other heavy DOM manipulation etc. So the default state that you had to write your app was that. But then, given time, I started to see the, the pain points of React and to have uh, points where the abstraction we have didn't work, so we needed new things like hooks, like pure components, and etc. So the abstraction leaks are kind of this: the points where the abstraction that React gives us out of the box is not enough, and we need more things. So I, I think I, I'm I'm not sure if that's what you meant, but when I talk about that, that's kind of the thing I meant. Oh, I do fine. I do have a point to what uh, you just said, like on compile time optimizations. I, I do have this big wish list item where like as a developer we see every day new compiler time optimizations landing in different frameworks or different pieces, right? Uh, recently Astro has come out where it is great for uh, content heavy because it can optimize sending less JavaScript and can only send like JS sprinkles, right? Uh, whereas Next.js has come out for SSR heavy and then there are a bunch of other frameworks. I would love if the framework, whichever I'm using, can look at my source code and alter its strategy, right? I'm, I'm great. I need to do these X, Y, Z things because this is a very interaction heavy page versus I can go more Astro way, right? Um, for context, like Astro is this new J uh, JavaScript framework, I can say. Uh, which has very uh, recently landed and it's meant for content heavy websites, not very interaction heavy, right? So if the framework itself can quickly realize looking at the code, what, what way does it need to deliver itself, that would be great, right? As a developer, I don't need to be, I, need to, I don't need to know like, hey, do I need to switch my tools? Because my, just one of the pages is marketing pages and it's very content heavy versus the other ones are forms heavy, versus the third ones are animations heavy. Like, can you morph yourself to suit the needs of, of the current response? That would be great. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Like, look at compile time and just change yourself. Yeah, actually, yeah. I think, like, just one point to add, like, uh, like a super big like to what Pratik said. Uh, one thing, like, uh, that I have been listening about, about the frameworks uh, is, Hey, the like the learning curve is like too much for frameworks. Like I have to learn JavaScript, and I I also like want to have to learn how to use the framework, right? So I think uh, this is also like one thing. Although like the frameworks have been trying to uh, do this uh, brilliantly, but this one thing I think if we can reduce this learning curve to a bit where the frameworks strategies or its perspective becomes you know wo more welcoming, because like what I've seen with React is. Uh, we call it a library, we call it a framework, that's a different, uh, different topic, but 
it gives you some perspective but it does not uh, like it, it tells you that okay it's opt in you might use it you might not use it it's completely up to you and why people you use react is it's just simple javascript like you, you know javascript then you almost know react so right. this is also one thing that i would like the frameworks to be like more welcoming because they're already bringing in so much to the table that's valuable so if it's easier to understand and like be uh, like and get acquainted with it faster so that's something that uh, you know, would add into the success of that framework. So, yeah. Rafi, do you want to add anything? So, in addition to all the other things that they said, there's one thing I really wished all frameworks did. Um, especially when coming up with a new feature, right? Um, in whatever framework, right? It'll be nice if the features are named in like simple words, like in a very simple words, because it's sometimes very hard to search. And like, let's say if I talking about like suspense, right? You might not know what suspense is if you didn't actually read the doc. So like naming things is actually a very hard thing in programming, but especially, yes. you know, in a library of sort, like it's, it'll be nice if they like go with the simpler names. Yeah, I mean, that's a problem I think everyone suffers with when you uh, start reading the docs of a new framework, especially <laughs> it's a random names that you have to know, then only you can search about them. Uh, so I think we should get some design system guy to start naming <laughs> things. They are pretty good at it. <laughs> if only it's possible, yes, why not? Uh, okay, so most of the times when, you, when we look at web frameworks, uh, the biggest thing we consider is how easy it is to get started with something, right? Uh, but what we often ignore is what happens after the app reaches production. Like, how do you think a web framework can make your life easy? in that regard, after the web is in production, what role can web frameworks play? You want to go? I can start. So, yes. we, have, we have like years of knowledge behind us on how to optimize web, uh, web applications, right? We do conferences every year, we do uh, courses and, and like there's a ton of knowledge of, hey, here's my web page, can someone look at it and tell me like how to improve it, right? I, I would love to see if some, like a web framework can create uh, an observability bot around all this knowledge that we have through all these years and can come back and tell me that, hey, you have shipped this thing, great, this works now, but probably you should go and change X, Y, and Z. You are, f you are having janks in your frames and this is coming from this X, Y, and Z piece of code because it's, it's a framework code, right? It's written with you. Uh, also, the, the manner these images are loading, they're not the best, probably go and use suspense list or something else, right? So like all these years of knowledge of performance improvement, if frameworks can start baking it in, this, this may, not, may or may not be a framework. This can be like a platform, right, that a uh, framework can have on site as an offering, but it's probably the right time that someone automated can start doing this. And I'm not hinting ML and AI here. It's just very simple, straightforward, start having bots, look at what we look as humans, right? And start telling me those things. As humans, I slip on them. I mean, the moment you say you want a machine to act like a human, you are already... <laughs> I, I very, that's why I clarified that I'm not hinting don't, don't throw AI, uh, AI ML just because I said this. So do you want something like uh, what happens with Next.js where they have ESLint uh, configured to tell you that that's, load That's still like pre-commit, right? Yeah. Uh, that's, that's a that's start, great. right? That's a, that's, a, that's a start in the right direction. Okay. Uh, I want to see that more like if someone can come back and tell me, hey, I profile it for you, yeah. right? Oh, yeah. Uh, do you also write a ton of like cron jobs to profile your website here and there, a lot of things. I have done that in my career, right? Yeah. I don't want to do that. Exactly, right. Anymore. So I'm assuming that's where you're also period. coming from. Right? Exactly. So, yeah. yeah, I think telemetry and application monitoring is definitely another region that would help. Uh, By the way, we already have Kent here. Why not like, <laughs> we, we like sometimes discuss with him like, why not add AI stuff <laughs> with Remix and all, so yeah. So, I mean, they're just adding feature requests for you. <laughs> it's a feature request, yeah. <laughs> okay, uh, Rafi, do you want to add something? Uh, okay, no, nothing, fine. 
Okay, so we are short on time, so we'll go to the last question. Uh, where do you think framework can help you with your architecture? I didn't get your question. Uh, what is it about? So I mean, first thing, like you can think about it in a way that how much does your framework influence your architecture and how they can help you in deciding the architecture. Like one of the things that you generally have to, you know, discuss a lot is which architecture should we go ahead with so that it's scalable, maintainable and all that. Uh, but can framework come and say that, hey, uh, you should be using this. I think this is somehow related to what Pratik said, like we have all those learnings. Feature and request. Yeah. There's someone, not a machine, uh, who comes and says that, okay, this is the way uh, you can do it. But do you have any ideas about that? Like how can frameworks help you decide your architecture? That would be really tough, right? Because uh, then you also have to look at how your backend is set up, how your data fetching pipelines are set. Uh, although some of it the framework would already know, depending on how uh, are you fetching multiple APIs, are you using GraphQL. Uh, I think the architecture dramatically changes. Uh, how many cache layers do you have? At what stages are you caching things? And the choices keep changing. And we did an entire four-hour workshop trying to solve that. But we just had a lot of different optimizations laid out for people. And we just said, pick whatever works for you. Uh, the way at least we work, or at least I work, is that uh, I like my frameworks like an open heart surgery. Everything ready for me to tweak. Uh, and I look at other frameworks, see where they fell apart, and try fix it on my own preemptively. Okay. <laughs> okay. I don't think anyone wants to add something to it. Fine. Then yeah, I think uh, what we can summarize from here is uh, we want more automation in our frameworks. We want the framework to tell us what we should do. Uh, use the learnings that we have had since years, uh, provide a better debugging experience that's always important and developer experience and yeah I mean use cases, features and all definitely there will never be an end to how many features you want in your, uh, in your framework but these are the things that actually stand out because you can always choose a framework because you know it has some feature and later it gets added to other framework which you rejected, right? So, uh, yeah, I mean, it's good to hear different perspectives, what's important for whom, instead of just saying that, hey, here's a list of pros and cons of this framework versus this framework. There are thousands of blogs all over, you know, all over the internet and we didn't want to get into that, but still talk about something relevant. So, uh, thank you everyone. Uh, and I know there has been a delay, <laughs> so we are really sorry for that. Uh, I think, yeah. Thanks. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much. Okay, I think.